kitchen. Perfect. Um, Perfect. We've got some amazing things that are happening right now. And I wanted you on my iPad, which I will disconnect you because you're on my laptop here. But I've actually got Ray uh, Catterley and oh. we're our open house is still going on. We've still got builders that are working on a wall as we mm -hmm. speak. Um, so we can kind of go through the questions that we talked about. I can show you what's going on. We can talk about the open house and what we're up to here and how we can support really anybody in the industry and see, you know, help Beautiful. them get to where they want to go. Oh, you, you kind of read my mind because my first question meant to be, we wanted to get a flavor for how it went or is going because this is your third annual open house. So do you want to say a few more things about it? Yes. Oh my gosh. We had an amazing evening. Um, I have a map and I put stickers from all the different states. We had 19 different states come. We had wow. Hawaii all the way to Boston and then South Dakota down to Texas. And then we actually had a couple countries fly in just for our event. And it's humbling. I mean, just the, the thought that people want the the knowledge that we have and believe that our event holds enough value to input their time and energy and money to come to Great Bend, Kansas and see what we're doing here. I, I couldn't have asked for anything, anything more. That's and so just we had, popular. in terms of vendors, we had everything from the machinery side. Fish Enterprise came down and brought their four cut sickle. We had Almago, which is a more specialty equipment uh, company. We had we had Ray Kadiri, Tim White from Texas Healthy Homes. We had um, the Stucco Boys from Dodge City, Kansas. And so they are busy in the Hempcrete and have a housing development that they're working on in Dodge City, Kansas, which is right down the road. They are movers and shakers in the industry. Um, we just we just had so many people come from different facets of the industry. We brought the conservation district in with the USDA. They did cover crop demonstrations with their rain simulator and the importance of soil health. Um, we had topography maps, like it's called the sandbox, and we brought that in as well. So people could understand how their waterways affect their fields and things like that. So we tried to touch on everything from farming, uh, fiber field tours, the Global Hemp Association. We toured all their big variety trials that are going on, and then um, just making networking, making connections. Um, it was an amazing event. So we did all that last night. And then today we did, we started a hempcrete workshop. Ray led that in support with all the other builders that were here. It was very much a team effort. I bet we had 50 people here for the workshop. Um, so they're working on a wall right now. We toured our fiber, fiber processing facility at noon and then they're back, they're back building right now. So other than that, nothing's going on. Not so. much is happening. Well, obviously, we will never conflict with your annual thing in the future because I want to have been there. I was going to say, USHBA just needs to ha have a boost next year. And there then you, you can go. We'll just, you can we'll have just a live cast from your place, right? Yes. You can take over my office. You can run the headquarters here, and then everything else can be at our farm. So I like it. I like it. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Well, it is so great to see you again and uh, to hear how much amazing stuff. And it doesn't surprise me at all that people came from other countries to be at your event. That's fantastic. So we had talked about just kind of getting a snapshot about how it's going this year, how you're scaling in terms of how much acreage and the, that of your neighbors and whether it's bigger this year than last and just sort of how you see that piece evolving. Oh, absolutely. So with our grows right now, our goal at the beginning of the year when we started our growers meetings and started having conversations was 2000 acres. And the reason is, is you have to look at the processing facility. We have to look at our efficiency slash capacity per hour and then basically work backwards. So right. if we run, want to add a third shift, because right now our processing facility runs 16 hours a day, six days a week, two eight hour shifts. And so if we want to move to 24 seven or even 24 six, um, we've got to do some things on the back end to otherwise there's not going to be enough material to let that let the facility run. Right. And so we we put a goal in of 2000 acres and we knew we needed to have conversations to farmers. We needed to make sure the pricing was right. As you guys know, commodity prices are up this year, which 
you know, some processors really struggle getting those acres. I will say that we were very thankful. People really believe in the vision and what we're doing and we were cost competitive um, and we, we have less inputs, you know, so that's less passes across the field, less pesticides they potentially would have to spend money on because chemicals also more expensive. So at the end of the day, it was just a cost analysis. Can I get a better ROI for growing hemp than I can for corn, soybeans, wheat, or milo, which are the crops that we're competing against? Um, we uh, did contract around 1,700 acres, and uh, we always leave a little bit of wiggle room because uh, we do get calls from farmers that you know, maybe put product or put hemp in that didn't have a home for it, or their processor, you know, maybe maybe dropped them and they couldn't they couldn't find a place to go, which sad, but it happens. And so we try to leave a few hundred acres to help help other farmers that are needing to off take product. Um, I will say of those 1700, I would 75, 80% looks really good. Um, we did have some Western Kansas folks. As you guys know, hemp uses less water than your traditional crops, but it still needs water. And so right now out in Western Kansas, you know, there are some spots that have gotten less than two inches since last September. You know, they're in extreme drought conditions. The weeds aren't even growing. They're not growing, their, they're not even mowing their grass. And so hemp can't even, even flourish in that. And so you've got to have a little bit of, of water to get this crop up and moving. Uh, so those acres we know will not be as productive. We have acres in Eastern Kansas and Missouri that are flourishing. And so farming is really a law of averages. Uh, and so we know that we're gonna, we're doing okay. We're very happy with where we're at. Right, right. Yeah, you have to, you just have to juggle so much to make that scale work. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and there's That's, a lot of faith that goes into it. You know, you're you're putting a seed in the ground and you're hoping Mother Nature cooperates and does everything that you need her to do. We're right. very blessed. We have irrigation. We can make it rain when we need to. But there's a lot of farmers that want to see hemp, you know, really flourish that, that don't have those irrigation capabilities. Right, right. Absolutely. And and I was thinking about talking to you about your sort of ratios of, I know you do CBD and you also do industrial. I don't know whether you've stepped into the grain or where are you are in, in all of that. And has that been evolving as the market demand shifts? We're everywhere. So um, what we do is we do have dual purpose. Um, we always allow our farmers to grow for dual purpose. We do not have a grain processing facility, but we have work and have contracts, working contracts with people that do process grain. So any of our farmers that want to capitalize on that dual purpose crop, we can help them move their product. We really try to create a central hub. Uh, we don't want them to go through and have to vet these people, figure out who the good companies are, who isn't. So we just tell our farmers, come to us, we'll get it moved for you. Um, obviously we purchase all the fiber. We do allow our farmers to do the grain. We do a little bit of grain ourselves. And then in terms of CBD, we have about a 2,100 square foot greenhouse. I would say that's more for research purposes. Um, most of my clients are hiring me to find different organic fungicides or insecticides that are gonna help you know, in their particular market. So it's a little counterintuitive because now that the, the open house is over, I am going to basically turn on all the water, make it as humid as possible, try to get disease in there and bring in all the insects because I need to find if those, those products are gonna work for you as a commercial um, user, end user, so. Right. So yeah. they look really good, but I'm about to make them really ugly. <laughs> <laughs> but that's your job. So that's great. Yes. Well, that's where the other part came in of what I was describing you do. That makes sense. Um, and so do you see it, I mean, I mean, I know we're kind of early on, but you have been on the front edge as a, you know, as a family doing this uh, longer and, and, you know, you've got the entire Midwest, you're the biggest processor out there. What is your sense of the shifting landscape and your kind of crystal ball around demand and what people are looking for? Demand's there. I mean, that's the most exciting part. Um, 
farmers are looking for ways to diversify their their farms and so the demand for the acres i think on a farming aspect it's there um, again you've got to be cost competitive but in terms of in product coming out of our processing facility i mean we wouldn't push to be 24 7 if we couldn't support it you know and it does no good to run our machine and have bags of hemp sitting against the wall um, thankfully the herd pretty much moves out as fast as we can bag it um, or run it through our machine, depending on if people want like the huge super sacks or like the compressed vacuum sealed bags. Um, the fiber is a slower developing industry. We do have a lot of fiber that we're currently sitting on. What is exciting is we're sending out a lot of verification samples. You know, there's a lot of trying trial and error that's happening right now. So I know it's going to get better. Um, I know that product will move. We just need to be patient and, and do that. On a plus note, the dust also moves. We've got industries that are really capitalizing on the dust. I love that there's zero waste that comes out of our facility, except for the twine that we unroll from the bales. That's so. fantastic. That's so beautiful. Such a long range, sustainable. I mean, that's part of why we love this plant also. Uh, but yes. it's great that you've developed all those all those end users. That's really fantastic. So we had talked about kind of going, taking a little bit of a dive in how you approach your collaboration with your neighbors, the way that you have been, you know, because you put up that big processor and you're working to absolutely identify, you know, how much you can use and doing all those calculations. But how do how do you collaborate with your neighbors? How does that work? Um, when you say neighbors, you're talking other processors or other farmers or what's... What? I, I guess I'm thinking other hemp growers that are then giving you the yield to put through your processor. I think that's what's going yes. on. Okay. Yeah. So we are 100% a support system to them. We need them to be successful in order for us to be successful. So we don't go out, we don't charge consultant fees if they're growing for us, if they've signed a contract because we need them to be successful, bottom line. Um, we supply the seed for them, we buy in bulk, so that way we can get them the best price. We turn around and sell it to them at cost, because again, we need them to be successful, we need them to be profitable. You know, it's, it's, it behooves us for them to have a successful season. Um, before the season even starts, we have conversations about how it needs to be planted, what density requires, or we're required, requiring them to plant. You know, we put that all in the contract. Um, we talk about nutrients. Uh, this is kind of an area that we do allow a little wiggle room because farmers know their own ground best. Um, but we do ask that they pull a soil sample. You know, what what do we suggest to help them have the most successful season and have great grows where they're going to be profitable? Um, there's a lot of information out there. And we really found that to be necessary because we had one farmer that had a, a great grow um, but he wasn't profitable. And the reason was he did a, a lot of extras. Um, you know, he put down nutrients that the plant wasn't going to utilize. He did some extra steps that it was like, this really unnecessary. You know, it's always a cost analysis thing. By inputting this, am I going to get that much more return that I can justify that cost? And so when we sat down with him at the end of the season, it was like, really, you could have cut a lot of these things out. And he said, well, I, I learned it from this, or I saw it on YouTube, which there's nothing wrong with that, but it's like, that's what we're here for. We've taken the, we've taken the lumps, we've taken the learning lumps. We've, it's been an expensive learning lesson. And so we're trying to help you streamline it as much as possible. Yeah. So we don't ever go out and recruit growers. Um, we don't, we don't approach farmers in that way. They know that we're out there. We continue just spreading our message. And if anybody wants to grow hemp, they, they find us. Um, so beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so it does sound like you're, um, in terms of these other uh, relationships, you know, I love that you're sort of helping them with, you know, you build it in about making sure that they're doing it in a way that is going to be cost effective for them, because then that works for you as well. But um, are you having them, are they all doing a the same sort of industrial, or do you sort of diversify in terms of what they're up to or? No, so we have a conversation at the beginning of the season. Uh, the first question we ask is, are you fiber or dual purpose? Um, because 
that is going to affect the genetics that we give them. Um, it, then we also talk about location. You know, I've got growers up in Nebraska that have a different genetic profile that I can give them because I generally give the farmers two varieties to pick from that I think are going to be very successful in their area. So, you know, my Oklahoma growers are going to have two different varieties than my Nebraska growers. And it's just really important that we keep that straight uh, because when it comes into the facility, we want to group it by batch, by farmer, and then by variety as well because it makes a difference for the end user, the manufacturers, when you send this off for testing for carbon sequestration, for ash content, for um, carbon percentages and things like that, like varieties matter. And so we allow that farmer to have that choice. Most of them are actually gonna say, hey, whatever you suggest, some will run a side-by-side -side trial and figure out which strip is best for them. Um, but that's, that's kind of what we do there. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then we can just sort of dive into the processing facility. It's fantastic that you've got enough consistent, uh, you know, you ability to use to to a run of two eight hour sessions and 16 hours a, a day running your processor. That's great. Uh, so can and you, you have to remember, like 14 of those hours are machine running hours. You know, there's cleaning, there's maintenance, like you've got to have your upkeep, because if you don't, you're going to be down longer than if you would have just taken the you know the hour each shift and checked over the machine you know uh, aaron says it all the time if it rolls it wraps and so you've got to check your bearings you've got to check and make sure everything's good fire is our biggest um oh, sure. potential hazard and so making sure the machine's in good working order for that next shift is really critical for success right and so, so uh in terms of you had sort of talked about that you have stuff to sell right now. Do you, do you, I mean, obviously, I guess I'm going to just take a step back for a second and say, obviously for us as a building uh, industry, you know, group, our Holy Grail is ongoing, uh, always available, uh, you know, building grade herd as from local suppliers in the U S. So are, do you still have a kind of cycle of fits and starts or are you able to keep a fairly smooth uh, flow of availability? How is that looking and how do you see that scaling? So one thing, and again, you have to take a step back as well. We talk to our farmers and so we have enough bales to run throughout the year because we don't wanna run so hard that, like I would rather tell a, a builder and be like, hey, you're 12 weeks out because I'm running, maybe I can only support one eight hour shift or whatever, than to run hard for six months and then you be unable to get an American supply for six. You know what I'm saying? And so for us, it's all about making the numbers work, making sure we get through the next season and we like we've done a really we've tried really hard with our builders of communicating with them if you know you've got a build let's get you on the line and so that way we can work backwards make sure you're getting your order when you need it um and then we can fill in all these other places for people that want maybe smaller orders or you know it's easier to move um because we get lots of like people that just want to do like a dog house or they're just testing and learning. So they only need 10 bags. And then you'll have a grower that's building a house or a builder that needs a house. And so he needs truckloads. And so if you can kind of break those apart to make sure that we're servicing everybody and, and letting them keep moving forward on their projects, that's really important to us. Right. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Um, uh, how do I ask this? I was sort of just had a comment about um, the, how the decortication is scaling. And you've sort of mentioned that about the fact that you may go to, you know, a, an eighth, a third shift if you have enough uh, capacity to sort of scale through that. Because uh, you have to think like we, you know, ultimately I would love 10, we, we call them regional facilities. Um, you know, there, there's like the mega facilities that are like $50 million facilities, you know, like Panda Biotech was going to be one of those facilities. I think of those like as like super Walmarts, you know, not everywhere needs a super Walmart and not everybody can get the funding to have a super Walmart. And so we've got little regional places and that's how we're going to make our network work because, you know, all in, if 
you need $2 million, that's a whole lot easier to acquire and is not quite as much to bite off and, and try right. to figure out at one time. Right. And you have to think in the last year, because we opened July 1st of 2021 for the processing facility, the amount of times that we've had to pivot to make this happen has been, you know, any business you're pivoting, but think of the hemp industry, like you're figuring it out as you go. And so you have to be a little flexible. And to me, when you're working on a smaller scale, it's much easier to change directions and still be effective. It's like turning a rowboat compared to turning a ship. Like it's a whole lot easier to ship that rowboat. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're, you know, somebody in the comment was saying, you know, it is all about regional facilities. Ultimately, we can really tell. And I think part, I realized as I was even asking the question, I'm wondering whether to what extent, because you're one of the few that are actually sort of up and running as a large area of, of producer of fiber and herd, that there are undoubtedly people approaching you from all around the country, as opposed to what you intend, which is sort of Oklahoma, Nebraska, and Kansas, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, so are you, how are you jockeying that or, or managing that? Can, can you speak to that at all? Yeah, I mean, it's hard right now. Um, there is a group of processors that are, you know, are getting up and going that we would trust. You know, if there's, if there's somebody else that can service them better, I don't have a problem sending that business on because in turn, that company that we're referring people to, they're gonna do the same for us. And I can promise you there's enough orders for everybody right now to make this, it's fine. Um, and then some people are just willing to pay. Like we're shipping to Hawaii. There's gotta be a processor between here and LA's port that is closer, but they want our quality of herd. They love our sizing. They love our stories. Um, I think people are willing to pay and are willing to go that extra mile for that connection. Um, people want to know where their product's coming from. They love that they can watch our, our social media, see the fields where they're growing, see the processing facility. They feel invested. They feel a part of their project from start to finish. You know, stories are a big thing right now. How do you tell your story? How do you share it? So when you build these hemp houses or these huts or whatever that you're building, um, if you can connect it to that story, it's only going to help you on whatever venture that you're working to use that facility in. Beautiful. Actually, that, that was going to be my final question, but we'll just you keep referencing it and it's like, let's just dive in. Uh, one of the things just for the those watching us that uh, we learned that you have one of the biggest social media presences and that you like have this huge <laughs> presence and we, we want that. <laughs> so, yeah. so tell more, you know, like you just explained, of course, that it's about stories, but how do you actually go about that? Yeah. What is your marketing strategy and how are you actually getting the traction you're getting other than the fact that you're obviously fabulous? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So this annoys a lot of people, but I have no strategy. I literally, I'm just genuine. Like what you see is what you get. Um, we show the good, the bad, the hard days, the good days on our social media. Um, I don't ever pre post any, like I don't ever schedule out posts. Or, like I just share what I'm doing that day. And thankfully we're busy enough that I've always got content. There's always something to talk about or Maybe it's not something that I've done that day. Maybe it's a conversation that I've had or a couple conversations that I've had this week that is like, wow, people are really either misinformed or they, they could know more information or they could have more correct information if I put this out there. So anybody trying to grow their social media, it's just about being genuine because people will know immediately if they have an online presence and you're here and then they, they go out of their way to meet you in real life. Or maybe you don't even know it. Like maybe you're at NOCO and someone's just observing you and you're not on like you would be on social media. They're going to know that you're fake. Like they're going to know that you're a poser. And if you're a poser online, like what else are you posing about? Right. And so what you see is what you get. Like this is me. Um, no matter. It doesn't matter if you meet me at NOCO or underneath the combine digging something out or sitting in my office right now, like, I'm, this is me. This so. is it. Yeah. And it, it, it's 
it's so much easier to be authentic because it's it's sort of, there's sort of this uniformity. You don't have to remember who you're. You don't have to keep track of anything. Like yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh yeah, and the guys exactly. are the same way. I mean, just we just we love what we do and we love sharing it. And people can tell when you're very passionate about it. If you're if you're having to reach for whatever you're posting about, then it's probably best just to not post about it. Right. Um, right. Because people can get in genuineness very quickly. Yeah. Who absolutely. are the red blooded Kansans? Oh, okay. So we run case IH equipment. Um, Great. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So if anybody that is not in the equipment world, case IH is red equipment, just like John Deere is green. And Aaron's family has been involved with the case dealership here in our community for a couple generations. And so we're very much into our case equipment. We're very proud. If you see any of our social media, you'll see that we run red all the time. And so they did a promotion and that's what red blooded Kansans are. Oh, I love that. That's fantastic. Uh, that's really great. Actually, that's Aaron, right? Oh, this one? Uh, we that's can't see that far out, I guess. Oh, hold on. Here we go. Yeah, there you go. Yep, now oh, we can. You've got Aaron. We've got Richard. Oops, Richard. And then up in that top corner is Brantley, which is Aaron's son. Um, yes. We're all about family, family farm. That's how we got started in this. So I love this. And then actually a lot of those farmers are from our community. So they're our friends. It's our family. Like That's who we are. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Brilliant. Um, Seba, Seba Tesfi also mentioned the, this issue of the regional facilities sort of helping us to avoid hemp becoming monetized and sort of, you know, becoming enormous uh, and just a few producers sort of taking over. How do you view that? And what's your sense of optimism, if you will, that this is that we are going to keep this local like you just described of, you know, your actual friends and neighbors in your community? Yeah, honestly, right now, I think it's going to be hard to monopolize. Um, the consumers are going to drive this. Mm -hmm. And so you can monopolize if you want, but if people don't want to pay for that transportation, you have to think transportation is your most inefficient cost right now. And in farming in general, you guys know what fuel prices are. And some of you aren't even farmers. You see it at the pump. And so one on a farming level, it's going to be tough to monopolize for processors because let's say you've got the super Walmart facility and you need 10,000 acres, the actual square footage of 10,000 acres, you're going to have to truck things in for miles or by rail, regardless, it's going to be expensive. And so by breaking up that monopoly, having more of these regional facilities, it's going to make it more efficient for your farmer, more efficient for your processor, and in turn, it's going to make it more efficient for your buyer because, you know, we have a hard time selling um, to people in Michigan because it's not cost effective. Like a price per pound by the time you add those shipping costs is not effective. Now, if we've got a facility in South Dakota and we've got, you know, we've got all these little facilities, then I, they, when they call me and ask for South Bend Hurt, I'm going to be like, I'm going to ship it out of the South Bend warehouse or I mean the South Dakota warehouse their shipping is going to be a half, like it's all these regional facilities. It's going to help reduce monopolization um, on every level, I think. Right. But, and as long as the quality is there for each organization, you know, which is mm -hmm. part of what we're trying to do at USHBA about, you know, helping to understand standards so that we get good, clean, safe herd for building. We love standards. We're very data driven. Um, you know, we send our samples off or we send everything off for testing now, like for, um, what is it? James Johnson with uh, Veteran Scientific Lab is who we use, but it does, you know, it's just a, a standard that we can send to our buyers and say, hey, this is our herd. This is what you're getting. Um, it, it just gives them a sense of security. So I'm thrilled for the day when this passes and there's standards for everybody that everybody right. has to fall into. Right. And it's okay. Like it's okay that there's standards and you can have the people shooting for the premium product. And then if you have buyers that want something cheaper, that's fine. But then they know that the standard is going to be here, not here or wherever it is. And so it just makes it safer for the buyer 
safer for the processor because it's very black and white of where we need to operate. And it's really, it's better for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And that's so much about what we're working on at USHBA about the ASTM standardized testing and all, you know, all these pieces for the, you know, in order to be in the building codes, that was so much of what we were working on was actually the standards. And my understanding, I haven't read it, but my understanding is that on USHBA's website, you can actually read what was submitted to the ICC to get us uh, approved. And they accepted what was submitted without any uh, amendments. So basically they said, this is good. We're gonna approve this in September. So people can so go then, check that out. Yeah, that's amazing. And that next step there is like, I volunteer for Farm Bureau. I'm on our county board. And then I also serve at the state level representing young farmer and ranchers for my district. Having those conversations, continuing to bring up hemp, this needs to be an insurance break for anybody interested in putting hemp in their homes because of the valuable things that it does. And so Farm Bureau has came out and toured our farm. We've had the president of Farm Bureau out here. We've continued to have those conversations. Farm Bureau is actually the first uh, commercial hemp pol policy they wrote for our processing facility. To me, that's huge because when you get the all states and the Farm Bureaus and the, the big insurance companies behind you, now you're now you're really entering a new ball game because yeah. people need to have the reassurance that their insurance is going to be covered because life happens we know that and so you need to know that you've got the support that if you're willing to try this product that is better for you better for the environment better for everything that you've got the back end support and you're not assuming all that risk right so again, standards standards we're all about them Yes, so. thank you. Yes. And but also I just had that just popped my mind to the fact that obviously the other thing that's, you know, going on is the insurance companies are going to have such a vested interest in helping us to scale because the fire, they, they're they going to be wiped out if we continue to have all these fires that are wiping oh, yeah. out neighborhoods of traditional builds. And, and we have some potential to stop, you know, to, to fix that, you know, like to be a, a, a you know, be able to pre prevent some of that. I mean, I know that we don't have the full on fire assessments yet, but we're working toward it. And it's clear that there's good indications. So um, I'm just looking through our questions That's here. I was just looking at too. Uh, opportunities for different manufacturing opportunities, because that, that actually did kind of cross my mind. Maybe I can expand on that, which is that I'm, I noted men, that you mentioned, Melissa, about that you got all of all the buyers in the world for herd, but that you're actually kind of sitting on fiber. And mm -hmm. I've heard so many different uses for the fiber, but do you think the word is just not out? I mean, I know it's about scaling things and we're, I keep mentioning, we only just got legal in 2018, you know, it's like we've been, we're like a baby industry, but what's your sense and your projection about what's needed to be able to have the fiber take hold? So the biggest challenge, I think, from a fiber standpoint is every industry is needing different specs. Mm. And in order to achieve those specs, you need equipment that can get you to specifically those specifications. So when a company comes to us and they say, hey, we need it cut to one inch length, this cleanliness quality, like you know, they've got their list. No. And it's like, okay, well, I need to buy a different piece of equipment to hit the paper pulping company or the automobile industry or all, you know, all the different industries need a different piece of finalized equipment. You know, um, Maddie up with Hemputecture, you know, I spoke with him and he's got the amazing idea. He's like, why would I ask all these facilities in the United States to get the piece of equipment that I need to get this, the fiber to my specs? Why wouldn't I just purchase your fiber at a little cheaper cost and I have the equipment at my facility to finish it? To me, that makes the most sense. If you're a paper company and you need it exactly this way, why are you asking me to invest in that money to make it that way? But then I can only supply you, which I'm fine with that if they're willing to sign a long term contract. And this is why I think we're sitting on fiber right now is because. Aaron, Richard, and I have a hard time. You know, we're, we don't have investors. We've bootstrapped this whole thing. I have a hard time dropping $100,000 for a piece of equipment that is going to service you 
But then if you decide in a year from now that you don't, you want to pivot out of him for whatever, right. what am I going to do with this piece of equipment? Like, so we either need to go in on it together or you need to put a down payment or we need to sign a contract that you're going to buy so many tons that it's at least going to pay off the piece of equipment. So I don't end up with payments on something that I can't utilize. Um, so I think that's the bottleneck right now. Um, we've assumed a lot of risk by can, by putting in the decortication facility, by contracting all these acres. Like we believe in the industry, we believe what we're doing, but we're asking these final manufacturers to meet us at 20, but yeah. you know, just come in 25%, just meet us a little bit. So we don't feel like we're just assuming all of the oh, risk really. all of the time. No, that and makes so sense. That's where we're at yeah. with the fiber. And it, thank you for that. And it does, uh, it, Saba was also talking about, you know, how to sort of, it seems like one possibility is that different different areas can, you know, like it's either that the the end user assumes that that risk by like the way Maddie's description was, but also the the issue of different different regions can sort of nearby regions could somehow concentrate on a particular aspect in some way. Oh, think about it. I mean, when you think cars, you think Detroit. Yeah. Detroit, Michigan. So any processing facility out there, you need to invest in the equipment that's going to help you facilitate the automotive industry. Right. That gets you into the cars. Know. Right. Where are your paper companies at? The East Coast. East Coast people need to be getting infrastructure to support the paper industry. Like that's where you need to go. And so, you know, right now, a New York company calling me, asking me to buy this specialty piece of equipment, I know that in a year from now, when more processors are online, without a contract, we're going to get dropped because it's going to be more cost effective for them to pick up a Maryland location or something like that. And so you really have to protect your company and protect yourself in terms of that because they're, they're going to find the cheapest option. That's economics. And that's OK, you know. Um, but we need right. to make sure that we're not in a bind. Yeah. Because you can't be left behind. Right. Yeah. Correct. So one general question I think that people are asking in the chat is just sort of this issue of, of can you unpack a little bit your own choices about what processing you are going oh, with yeah. and how you look at all of that. And, you know, it's sort of along the same theme we've been expressing. Yeah. So why we chose the processing line that we did um, when we were kind of give you the background story. Um, 2019, when we first started growing, um, our fiber crop was terrible. We literally did everything wrong. That's one of the reasons why we can support the farmers so well is because we can tell you all the things not to do. 2020, we had a very successful season. We had no intentions of being processors. We just wanted to farm. That's what we do. Um, we called our processor 30 days before harvest, said, hey, we're just confirming. This is what you want. We'll be ready to deliver in 30 days. And he told us, he said, hey, uh, I don't have the funding. I forgot to tell you that. And the, the feeling of defeat that day is something that drives me every day to continue working so hard is because I never, ever want any farmer to feel like I felt that day. You know, we had a whole field. We were thrilled. We, you know, we were on top of the world and then we had nothing. All we have is product in the field that is worthless, essentially. So that's when we decided to enter and become processors, Aaron and Richard and I. There's at that time there was three main options. You had the hemp train from Canada, you had the LaRouche from over in France, and then you had um, Formation Ag from Monta Vista, Colorado. And so, one thing that we are very passionate about is where we're from. We love America. We love supporting the U.S. economy. We want to keep our dollars here. We love supporting anybody local any smaller companies that are up and coming. So we went out and we met Corbett. We met his team at Formation Ag. Um, their vision of the industry and how they saw fiber and grain becoming the forefront. Um, you know, they were building decorticators before fiber was cool. Um, so th they understood the vision. They understood where it was going. Um, at that time, the hemp train was out of our budget. I mean, I'll be totally transparent. We were, we're balling on a budget. Um, and so we needed something that we could pay off 
um, that we could make this cash flow and be able to keep our doors open. And then the LaRouche was more expensive than the hemp train. And so thankfully, Corbett was a great fit. Formation Ag has been very good to us in terms of developing the machine, um, using our feedback to change their machine um, because we've, we've made a, modif a lot of modifications. Uh, that is one of the skills of Aaron and Richard and then our facility manager Dodge, who's been with us since day one, they're very handy. And so when you put over 3000 hours like we have on our machine, you figure out what needs changed. You figure out where your bottlenecks are and you figure out what needs adjusted. And so we've been able to kind of build pieces to help our machine flow better. Fantastic. So that is why we went with Formation Ag 660. We also love that the long stranded fiber in our machine, you know, we can always shorten it for other industries. Um, you know, if they want two to four inches, we can always shorten it, but sure. she just pretty much makes fiber longer. Yeah, so. yeah, it's rough. Yeah. It's rough. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the questions that's in the in here is is there a South Bend franchising to replicate what you do in other regions? Your processes are so logical. We're, we're going to be like the next Chick-fil-A. That's our there goal. You we're going to be fast, efficient, and I don't know. But um, maybe, honestly, we're open to it. Um, but the thing is, is we want to find the right people. Um, yes, we understand you've got to make profit because you, you have to keep your doors open. You have to keep your lights on. Um, but if you're not in it for the industry as a whole, you know, that's just not something that we want to be a part of. So we're never saying no to franchising. Um, and we've already had conversations and we've partnered with a couple facilities as they come online later in 2022 um, to help increase volume. Quality consistency is critical to us. And so again, it'll just be like, like McDonald's. When you go to McDonald's in California, it's the same as over on the East Coast. It's the same hamburger every time. Our goal is to have the same herd along with when you, the specs that you guys have, like our goal is consistency, no matter where it's coming from in South Bend. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, another question. How do you stop cross-pollination from farm to farm if there are different cultivars being used? Um, for fiber and grain, it's not that critical. Like I'm not seeing, for example, like we, we do a lot of testing on our farm we never ask any grower who is growing for us to try anything that we haven't personally grown on our farm first. And so we know there's going to get some cross contamination, but it's, there's no CBD, there's no THC. Um, it's just less, less of a problem for us. Um, actually, it's really not an issue at all. Okay. So That's we don't good. worry about it. That's good. I was going to make a comment that when you mentioned before that you've only been growing since 2019 and you did everything wrong and then you had this bumper crop in 2020 and couldn't find any way to process it, which is just horrifying. Um, but it was reminding me that I got to speak earlier today with Jeff Coswick, who's a Manitoba seed guy who's been an agronomist and farmer for 20 years because it's been legal up in Canada. Um, and he mentioned that his rule of thumb, it takes really three years to hit your stride. So um, so that made me think about that I was wanting to ask if you can kind of make a general kind of crystal ball projection of where you think things are going for you and for our industry and sort of just give us your vision of that. We've got about uh, 10 minutes left, I think. Um, gosh, crystal ball. The industry is going to continue to grow, but what people have to understand, and I, I cannot emphasize this enough, it does not matter how many processors are in the United States if you do not have the farming acres to support it. If we do not take care of our farmers, if we do not make sure they are profitable, and if we do not make sure they feel supported at the legislative level as well as at your processing level, this will not be successful. Um, I think there's a lot of processors that are coming online that didn't do their homework on their back end. And so they're not going to have bales. This is not like corn. You can't call the co-op or you can't call the next town over and get, get hemp bales. Like you've got to get those acres. You've got to support your processing facility. You've got to establish those connections. And so in order for this industry to be successful, no matter what, grain, fiber, 
CBD, whatever, you've got to support your farmers. And so for my crystal ball, it, you've got to continue working on the, the farming level. You've got to continue finding seed support for them. And then I would love to see, you know, the KD, like for us, the Kansas Department of Ag, they've been fabulous. You know, they, they work with us. They listen to our suggestions. Um, they really are here for the farmer. But now we need to get to the level that we've dropped the licensing fee to a more manageable amount. I mean, by the time you pay for testing, et cetera, it's going to cost you $2,000 just in license fees to grow. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, if you've got a 10,000 acre farm, that's pretty easy to absorb that cost, you know, in your cost per acre analysis. But if you only have five acre, or 500 acres and maybe you want to try hemp at 10 acres, which we highly encourage people to just try uh, first before like betting the farm on it, yeah. then your cost per acre for license is significantly more expensive. So again, cost analysis, it's got to work. Right. Um, in terms of processing, I think you're going to find more specialized processing facilities, you know, for our bioplastics industry, the amount of micronized herd that they're wanting for bioplastics, we can't support them. I mean, the smallest contract I've seen come across uh, South Bend's desk is like 100,000 pounds a month of micronized herd. You know, if we can't do that by ourselves, and if we did, we'd have to completely support, or, um, you know, uh, not be able to supply our builders or other things because we are funneling all that herd into micronized. So, yeah, I think you're going to get facilities that are going to specialize in micronized. I think you're going to get facilities that are really focused on building great herd and bedding um, and kind of find their niche within the industry. Right. That sounds that does make so, sense. Check back in with me next year and we'll see how correct my we'll see where you are. And we'll see how it's going. Yes, exactly. Do you, are you familiar with uh, one of the speakers that I got to talk with who's actually sponsoring our track is the National Hemp Growers Co-op. And they oh, do yeah. seem to have a model where they're, you know, they're figuring out the contracts so the farmer does really get their share and their, you know, piece of it. Have you are, have you looked at that model or you're, it's working well for you what you're doing? Yeah, so we call ourselves a growers group. And the reason is, is because in order to call yourself a co-op, there's a lot of le the legal paperwork that needs to go into that process. Would I love for us to be a co-op someday? Yes. Um, I'll be honest, I don't know how to set up co-op. I've got yeah. the documents. I just need to read them. I need to figure out what paperwork we want to try, you know. Right. But it's an it's an ever-going process. Um, as long as our growers are happy, we'll continue being a growers group. And we essentially act as a co-op anyway by sourcing their seed, like doing all of that for them. Do I think co-ops hold a valuable place? Yes. Um, but it needs to be done correctly because co-ops can be top heavy. Oh, absolutely. Um, Yes. And yeah. so you've got to, again, make sure your farmers feel valued, you know, and supported and make sure they feel a part of the process, which, you know, they do. They do right now. Like we had a um, growers appreciation dinner in December. Oh, great. So, you know, everybody brought our we cooked them. Aaron, Richard and I cooked the steak and potatoes for them. We just sat down around a round table and said, thank you for doing what you're doing. We understand it's scary. We understand that you've never grown him before, but we appreciate you putting your trust in us. And then the best part was, is we had conversations. This grower was like, hey, I did this and it didn't work. And then the other guy would be like, ah, oh, I did that, but then I changed it to this. And it's just, again, oh, lines of communication. Sure. That's how it's gonna grow and be successful. Right, beautiful collaboration. Beautiful. Yeah, that's really wonderful. And you also kind of mentioned about the testing and fees. And I realized that, that Morgan Tweet started us off today with the hemp exemption, you know, this that we're trying to get legislation to stop having hemp farmers have to jump through these licensing tests for how much THC they's got, they've got in an industrial crop. So oh, yeah. That yeah, we very much support the hemp exemption that they're working on. Um, I would love to see that come to life and yeah. we'll just continue working on it every day and continue educating and, and doing what we can. Right. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, uh, I, if anybody else has a question, oh, there is one. Let me see. Are here. you related to Willie? Ah, no. Um, but if you want, would you like to go out and see our hemp build real quick? 
Sure, as you're traveling, we've got a question. Do you think that the site of your processing facility could grow into a campus where hemp product manufacturers co-locate their facilities with yours to create a nice regional hub? Yes, that's actually why we placed it where we did. We're in the industrial park. We've got open ground all around us. So yes, bring your manufacturing to us and then all we gotta do is send it across the road. So. Beautiful. That sounds fabulous. We'd love to see your uh, see your spot. Yeah. Yes. Hey. So we, this is Angel. And Hi is, there. Yeah. And then this is his crew here. We've hey. got Ray Kadiri, and then his oh, right. team, and then right. yes, Ray right up there. We've got the U.S. Hemp Building Association on the computer. There. Um, yeah. So Excellent. we got our herd mixture. They're working That's on right. You're building your wall. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. So, Fantastic. Anyway. Fantastic. So is the wall plant, have you got a spot for it? <laughs> yes, actually we have a spot for that. We're very, very excited to um, take that to the farm shows, give people a real live. Exactly. So. Right. You would, yeah, we're trying to do some kind of example wall that we can take around as to, to shows as well, because it just really helps people. Ultim our holy grail is to create kind of a tiny home or almost, I think of it as like back in the day, a phone booth. I want to have oh, yeah. a phone booth so that people yeah. can stand inside of it and get the qualitative difference, you know, really feel how different it feels to be in a hemp building because it's wonderful. So... All right. Well, let's see. We've still got five minutes. You want any final words of wisdom for us? No. If you want to reach out and have any questions um, with South Bend Industrial Hemp, you can find us at southbendindustrialhemp.com or email me at southbendhemp at gmail.com. If I don't have the answers, I will happily send you to somebody that does. Um, there's a lot of great people in this industry. This open house that we have confirms that. Um, it really was a collaborative effort. You know, there was a lot of conversations that people came up to me and they were, they were telling me about their challenge or, or, you know, whatever it was or their need. And I was like, you need to talk to this person here or you need to talk to this person here. And so networking, collaboration, I'm telling you, in order for us to really blow this industry up, like we know it should be, we've got to work together. Absolutely. absolutely. I, I keep mentioning that Jake at the beginning of the day mentioned that basically we are creating community here at USHBA because we're just this sort of nonprofit spread across trying to do strategically valuable things to help lift the whole industry. And because we all believe in it. And so we'd love for yeah. other people to get as engaged as you are and uh, and sort of join as members and and then get involved as members. But and one thing that I would really, really encourage people get out of the hemp, echo, the hemp space, you know, like you love him. I love him. All the people on here today love him. And so we turn into this echoing hall. And so go to your local farm shows, go to areas that are maybe not hemp focused and just have a conversation. Um, you know, you don't have to be like pushy or anything like that. Just wait for your opening. They'll ask what you do. Then you throw in the hemp thing and then people are intrigued. And so um, we really try hard to do the farm shows to do to get outside of the hemp space and have those conversations. Fantastic. That is such wise words because you're really right. We talk about this all the time now that we have to start actually reaching out to the ag shows and these other places where people are like, what, are we still smoking that? You know, and it's like, yeah, you got to work through that. But then they, they are on board because they'll realize. Yes. What Do you know really what I love the most about our open house last night? Okay. You had the farmers and coveralls, like the old school, like, you know, your typical farmer look. And then you've got like the man buns and the new age, you know, like hemp people that really believe it. And we're all sitting at the same table. You know, we're all in the same space. We all respect each other and can have these conversations. So, you know, don't let looks be deceiving. There's just, there's so much value in the knowledge that they have and you have, and you can work together to grow. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Couldn't have said it better. That's so beautiful, Melissa. I'm really grateful that you had such an amazing BAFO event. And, we'll see you uh, next year. Yeah, right and we'll July. Don't before. plan anything. Plan to be in Great Bend, Kansas. What was the date? Um, I believe it's July 7th. So it's the second Friday in July every year. Okay, we will we will plan for it, everybody. I'm sure on. We'll get you a booth. We can get you a booth. You'll be all set up. This is gonna be good. I'm excited. Yeah, uh, me too. Me too. It is so great to talk to you again. I got to interview you last year a little bit, but this has just been spectacular. So thanks so much for giving us your time when you're on fumes. But I'm sure you're still very excited from all that you've been doing. So talk to me tomorrow. Yeah, to I'm still on the adrenaline high right now. Exactly. So tomorrow I'll exactly. be pretty worthless. Exactly. All right. Well, you were very worthful today. So thank you. Thank so you.